Excellent. So my name is Stuart. I'm the head brewer of Brewdog, and yeah, welcome. <laughs> uh, been with the company for nearly six years now. Started just after they opened up in 2007, and I love the company. I love the beers that we do. Uh, I love the ethos because we are very, very different from everyone else in the UK. Certainly, we are the uh, the pinnacle of the craft brewing revolution. We are pushing new beers in different directions. We're using different materials, using different processes, and every, anything that we can to make beer a little bit more interesting and a little bit more different, a little bit more complex, a little bit more intense. Um, so it's a it's a very very fun company to work for, um, and yeah. Okay, so this is essentially where our process starts. This is called the brew house, or as we refer to it, the hot block. Uh, and this is where we combine three of the four major ingredients in beer, water, malt, and hops, to create wort. Now, wort is unfermented beer. Um, this is the medium that we will introduce the yeast to, which then ferments out and turns into alcohol. So these four vessels down here are really just there to extract all the flavor, all the aroma, and all the sugars, the medium that the, or the, the material that the yeast will use to ferment um, to make it the best possible beer that we possibly can. So using incredible ingredients, using state-of-the-art equipment, um, and yeah, to make sure that the, the, the war is amazing, the beer can be amazing. All right, so this is the sweet wort. Um, this is what we've extracted from that malt material at the beginning. Um, contains all the sugars, contains the color, uh, and contains the aroma of all the malt. There's no hops in here yet, but uh, as soon as we start chucking hops in there, that's the perfect base for our beer. It's a little bit hot. So the brew house is the first stage of the process. Second stage of the process is where the real magic happens inside these fermentation vessels. The brewing side of things is very locked in, it's very technical, there's an awful lot of parameters that we can measure and that we can control throughout the process. As soon as it gets into the fermenters, it's up to the yeast. So all we can do is make sure that the yeast is in the best possible condition as it goes in, um, so it doesn't create any off flavors, so it doesn't have any fermentation uh, problems. But this is where it really takes over. This is where we're converting all those sugars that we've extracted from the brew house into alcohol, and the yeast is doing that. It's eating the sugars, turning those sugars into ethanol and creating beer. So the beer will stay in these tanks for the entire length of its time here. So essentially a month, wire to wire, brew in, pitch the yeast, uh, ferments out three or four days, chill it down, we add more hops to it to give it even more flavor. So the beers like Punk IPA, 5AM Saint, Hardcore, they've all been dry hopped uh, inside the tank. and then we chill them down and mature them. Now the maturation stage is essentially where we're looking for all those crazy flavors um, to become a lot more uniform and a lot more kind of married together. It's the same process as maturing wine in barrels or whiskey in barrels and stuff like that. It just um, creates a much more drinkable product and in this case beer. So yeah, sits in here for a month flavor matures and we taste all these beers three times a week to make sure everything's going okay. That's our biggest concern. Um, we're not so concerned about the bottom line and um, the cost implications of what we're doing. We're concerned about making amazing beers. So we taste these beers all the time to make sure they're doing okay, make sure that there are no problems with them and that they're developing okay. So we get six brews off the brew house um, that's going into one of those fermentation vessels. So we'll brew six times into there. These guys we just brew into once. Uh, but these are mostly reserved for like Coco Psycho, uh, Tokyo, the special beers, the collaboration beers, the beers that we don't do a huge volume of, but are a little bit more difficult to brew um, and ferment out. So they need a little bit more care and attention that we keep them inside so we can keep a really, really close eye on them. Uh, and so after, the, after they finish in these tanks, we're essentially filtering and all the filtration processes is removing those particles within the beer and turning it into that nice, nice clear beer. 
you can see there's no there's no real floaters and that's you know that's the stuff that you'll see out of the bottle and out of the keg and stuff like that out of the fermenter it's very cloudy there's a lot of yeast there's a lot of hops um, and other kind of material in there that is uh, going to make it a little bit hazy So this is our hardcore IPA, uh, double IPA that we do. It is um, super orangey. We, the thing about beer is it's, uh, it's a very agricultural product. So our beers will never be 100% consistent. The same as, for example, Budweiser are. Those guys spend millions and millions of pounds every year on making sure that if you drink a Bud in the UK, it'll taste exactly the same as a Budweiser in Japan or whatever. Um, because we're using malt and hops, they're very dependent on the environment that they're growing in, so the soil conditions, the weather, um, anything that can kind of influence them and will influence their flavor and how they are perceived in the beer. So we will have slight batch-to-batch -batch variants within the beers, and I think it's quite a cool aspect, actually, because it means that you have got something that's, uh, you know, a little bit interesting, a little bit different, and there's a little bit of excitement, you know, what's the next batch of hardcore going to be like? Is it going to be really piney? Is it going to be really molly? Is it going to be really orangey? So this batch that we've got here is uh, super, super orangey. And that's all coming from the hops. Um, we use a vast amount in this hops. We're probably the biggest hop user in, I would say, the UK. We put an awful lot of hops into these beers purely to give us that incredible aroma. And you can smell it. As soon as you smell it, you just get that orange and pine, uh, there's a little bit of apricot in there, uh, some jam and stuff like that, and it's um, just a huge medley of different flavors. And that's a 9% beer. It doesn't really taste like it, It doesn't. you don't really get that. A lot of 9% beers, like Tenant Super, for example, um, is very alcoholic, and you know you're drinking a really, really boozy beer. But that, because it's got a lot of malt complexity, a lot of hop intensity to it, it's quite smooth and it's quite drinkable. Uh, and kind of deceptive for that. Not row. Yeah. We've, uh, this is all the hops that we put into the tank, by the way. Smells amazing, but it doesn't taste very good. <laughs> tank, we've somehow got to separate that off from the beer, and it's not not the easiest thing to do. Um, it gives the beer an incredible extra dimension to it, um, especially with the hoppiness, gives it a really, really kind of fresh hoppy hit. But there are very, very few breweries in the UK that carry out that process, simply because it's very, very costly and... Uh, ouch. <laughs> very, very costly and costly to put the hops in, and then constantly get the hops back out of the beer at the end of the day. So, yeah. But it makes the beer amazing, and that's, you know, that's what we're doing, that's why we're in this. 45 different countries, so we've spread our customer base out all over the world. Basically, so if we, you know, if we have an economy in a certain country or region that goes belly up, and people aren't buying as much beer, you know, we've still got other markets that we can ship our beer to um, but luckily what we found out is you know when when in times of economic uh, plenty people drink because they're happy and they're celebrating but in times of uh, recession people still pretty much drink it's you know it's 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 um it's a very beer is a very accessible thing um, it's not a huge price item like whiskey is uh, and it's a little bit more, I think, appealing to people our age than wine and stuff like that. Um, especially the beer that we make and the branding we use and the marketing we use and everything like that. So it's, it's, um, it's a big opportunity. I think we hit the ground in exactly the right time uh, in terms of this type of beer and what we're doing. Um, there's a huge amount of popularity for it. Sweden's our number one customer. Uh, Italy as well up there, Finland, Scandinavia on a whole, uh, you know, but we supply a lot of countries, just a small amount of beer, 
like Australia, Japan, Brazil, who are absolute sleeping giants. Those guys are huge beer fans. And if we can supply them enough beer, we can see our sales just skyrocketing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A bit of a kind of nautical theme with the, you know, the shark and the, um, uh, forget the name of the whale with the big horn on its head. Uh, there's a big octopus on the other side and the, what else? That's supposed to be a sea cucumber. That, um, that long kind of green thing that's being grabbed by that octopus. I didn't really see it, but <laughs> so yeah, they just, um, they just wanted to do something that was very, very unique and very, very brew dog. Um, and it's really nice because it, um, it's our little stamp of identity. It should give you a, a decent idea. So um, the end of history, along with the Sink the Bismarck and the Tactical Nuclear Penguin are freezer beers. They've been freeze distilled. Uh, in Germany, they call it icebox. So basically what we're doing is taking the beer, putting them in these big pods. Uh, the temperature in here is about minus 20, 25 degrees. And that basically freezes all the water, but leaves the alcohol liquid. Um, so what we'll do is we'll take this out of here, run all the alcohol off as fast as we can and leave the water as ice solid. Um, and it basically strengthens the product by taking out the water. And then we just can just do that process over and over and over and over again until we hit, well, Tactical Nuclear Penguin is 32% ABV, the Sink to Bismarck is 41, and the end of history was 55% ABV. So we actually needed a special freezer for that. We couldn't get uh, temperature low enough to get the alcohol up to 55%, so we had to get a little lab-grade freezer that went down to about minus 80 degrees. So it's pretty, it's pretty, pretty gnarly stuff. But it was a really, it was a really fun um, little, sideline that we did that was not only you know created some some really really nice beers but it was also really controversial um and it kind of springboarded us into the not just the local but the national media so when we were a very very small company about three maybe even four years ago we obviously didn't have a marketing budget we couldn't pay for any advertising or anything like that so we did things that were a little bit naughty to try and um bring attention to ourselves. And it worked really well because we did it in a way that uh, promoted beer, um, promoted great beer, and got people talking and thinking about what beer is and what beer shouldn't be. The end of history, we stuck that inside bottles, which were inside squiddles. Um, I might need to actually show you one of these to provide a little bit of context. I don't know if you've seen pictures of them or anything. You have, okay, yeah, that's fine. Um, <laughs> Roadkill, that's the first thing I always say because we, um, I've been booed a couple of times when I've been speaking about this publicly and we actually received death threats when we brought this out because people were like, you guys are going out and shooting squirrels and stoats and then putting bottles inside them and it's, you know, desecration and all this stuff. So uh, they were roadkill, you know, we didn't actually go out and kill any squirrels, but it was, it was again, it was something that was just completely radical and had never been done before and had never really been thought of before you know when we went to the taxidermist and asked her to do this she was like what the hell are you talking about this is completely completely off the charts but it worked really well because um we got the beer put it inside these bottles it sold for a lot of money because it cost us about five or six hundred pounds i think to do per animal it took a lot of um a lot of work for the taxidermist to do. So we sold it at the time as the world's most expensive beer, which again added a little bit of weight to its, um, its imagery and stuff like that. So, you know, we had fun with it and we, we pushed it as far as we could and we had a little bit of a, a back and forth. There was a German company called Schorsbrau that were doing an ice block um, at 31%. So we released Tactical Nuclear Penguin at 32%. Um, so they released a beer, forget what it was called, at 40%. So we released Sink the Bismarck with the obvious kind of German reference, you know, the ship, the Bismarck, um, at 41% to basically try and goad them into a little bit of a back and forth, a little bit of a competition. And it worked to a certain extent. Um, they came up with a beer at, I think it was 50%, and then we brought out the end of history. You know, this is our, this is our end of the kind of competition. Yeah, this is, this is the statement. Um, 
and yeah, put it inside the put it inside the animals, which was a bit of a twist. But uh, yeah, like I said, it's just it's all about getting people talking about beer, what it should be, what it shouldn't be, um, and if people are talking about beer and they're excited and stimulated by these conversations, then they're out and they're thinking about what they're drinking. They're not out there picking up cans of Carlsberg and bottles of Stella and stuff like that. They're out there looking at exciting beer, craft beer, and you know, trying to expand their minds a little bit. Um.